All the dominoes never fall at once, they fall sequentially, and sometimes there are time gaps between them, and everyone says, all, all good. Um, it's not all good. You have to look behind the curtain of the international monetary system, understand what's actually going on. Uh, the real problem has to do with tight money. And, you know, uh, interest rates are 5% in March 2022, they were zero. I mean, people remember Paul Walker raised interest rates to 20%, and he did, but that played out over a couple of years. And the Fed's not done. I mean, they're saying, well, we're going to think about it. We want to look at more data, but they have not said we're done. This whole pivot narrative has been wrong for a year and it's, it's wrong now. So we have tight money. We have underwater bonds. We have management, bank management who don't know the first thing about risk management. If you knew anything about risk management, once the Fed said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to raise rates until we kill inflation. And that is what they said. Well, if you're a bank risk manager and you hear that, you're like, I got bonds, interest rates go up, bond prices go down. I understand they're unrealized losses unless I sell them if in what's called a hold to maturity account, but they're still losses and it still destroys confidence. Now bank runs today, you know, you don't have to line up around the corner in the rain, you know, with your hat on waiting for to see the teller. You can just do it with your iPhone and to the tune of you can move a billion dollars with your iPhone if you, you know, with the right accounts and passwords and all that. And so that's what happens. So the bank bank runs are instant instantaneous and a good analog is the 2008 financial crisis everyone remembers you know september 15th 2008 midnight on a sunday lehman brothers files for bankruptcy and that's true but that started in the spring of 2007 uh, when hsbc reported disappointing earnings based on mortgage losses and then came to a head in august uh, two Bear Stearns hedge funds failed. Uh, there were high high yield mortgage funds. At the end of July, August, the Fed raised a discount rate. It took a, a, a full year, another 13 months to get to Lehman Brothers. And what happened along the way? Bear Stearns in March 2008. Fannie Mae went bankrupt in June 2008. Freddie Mac bankrupt in June 2008. Congress bailed out the system in August 2008. And then Lehman Brothers. So that took a year and a half. And there are a lot of crises like that. So we're we're in a we're in falling dominoes. It's not over. It'll get a lot worse, and people should prepare for that. But as usual, they don't. They people are very complacent. Wall Street says it's all good, and people believe it, but they shouldn't. You know, I remember the Hirsch Dodd Bank collapse in 1974. That was a foreign exchange crisis. But through the you know the early 80s with the Latin American debt crisis, and the late 80s with the SNL crisis, and then 1994 the Mexican tequila crisis with the collapse of the peso. 1998 long-term capital dot com 2007 2008 you know october 19th 1987 the stock market fell 22 percent in one day not a year but in one day so i've i've been on the front lines of all those but the one thing i've noticed is that each crisis gets bigger than the one before and each bailout is bigger than the one before and the question i'm asking as an analyst is are, are we are, are we at the point where the crises are so big, it's bigger than the Fed. In other words, we're not really talking about bailing out a bank or a sector. People lose confidence in the dollar itself. And we do seem to be heading in that direction. You can think of the dollar and, and gold as kind of two sides of the seesaw, you know, one's up and the other one's down and then vice versa. When people talk about the price of gold, it's really the dollar price of gold. You can think of gold by weight. So uh, yeah, a strong dollar usually means a lower dollar price for gold and a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. And we've seen that dynamic play out in recent months. It's not the only driver of gold, it's one of them. There's a good old fashioned supply and demand. Sometimes you see in a financial panic, gold and the dollar will both get stronger. The dollar will get stronger against other currencies and gold will get stronger measured in dollar terms because there's a flight to quality. Get me out of, you know, yen or yuan or rubles or euros or whatever else it might be. Get me into treasury securities. And the thing about a flight to, to quality, it plays out in, in security space. You, what you want to get are really treasury securities. You want to get really short-term treasury bills and, and treasury notes. But to do that, you need dollars. If you're a foreign banker, or foreign investor, and you want to buy some four-week treasury bills, you got to get dollars to pay for them. So the, the rush into save treasury securities creates a demand for dollars. And then at the same time, gold is another saving. So sometimes it's the seesaw. Sometimes they can both go up at once. I guess uh, what I'm, I'm really saying is that I see gold getting stronger. The the dollar is uh, very much in the news. It's one of the questions I get most frequently. You know, you talk about Ukraine or China or inflation and all that, but it usually comes back pretty quickly to the dollar. And But I find there's a lot of confusion on the topic. The people don't distinguish between the role of the dollar as a payment currency 
and the role of the dollar as a reserve currency. And those are two very different things. There's some linkages, but payment currency, basically, if I want to buy goods and services from you uh, and I tender some form of currency and you're willing to accept it and you're confident someone else will accept it from you, that's a good payment currency. It could be dollars, it could be euros or yuan, or it could be Russian rubles or Brazilian rice or, or anything, as long as people are willing to accept it, have confidence in it. And, you know, when we were kids, we'd use baseball cards and bottle caps. So almost anything could be a reserve currency. You need payment channels and, and there's a little more to it than that, but that's basically it. A reserve currency is a very different thing. First of all, we don't really have reserve currencies. You know, you go to the People's Bank of China, they don't have hundred dollar bills stacked up in the basement. What they own are U.S. Treasury securities, which are digital, by the way. The last paper Treasury security was issued, I think, around 1979. So what they have are, are actually securities. So when people say reserve currency, what they really mean is securities that hold your reserves denominated in a currency. So, of course, treasury securities are denominated in dollars, but they don't have actual dollars, you know, in a bank account or a physical form. They own securities. Now, as far as the payment currency is concerned, that's relatively easy to displace. This is what all the news is about. So Saudi Arabia is talking to China about accepting yuan in exchange for Saudi oil. Brazil and China just negotiated a major agreement where the Brazilians could pay in ice for Chinese exports manufacture products, semiconductors, the Chinese can pay in yuan for Brazilian, you know, sugarcane, soybeans, aircraft, Embraer, uh, and other, and oil and other products from Brazil. The BRICS, you know, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, you know, about a third, we should close to half the population of the world when you throw in India and China in the same group. They've now rebranded themselves as BRICS Plus. So when they have their meetings, they're inviting Iran, Turkey, Argentina, you know, and a lot of large countries, important countries that were not part of the original BRICS, they're, they're working on a new payment currency and that we're likely to see a big rollout of that. Don't know exactly what it'll be. They're working behind the scenes. It could be commodity backed, it could be gold backed. I'm not predicting that, but that's certainly one of the possibilities that we need to look at. But again, these are, these are payment currencies. Now, when you get over to reserve currencies, it's it's much stickier. It's much harder to displace the dollar's reserve currency because it's not really about the currency. As I mentioned, it's about the securities market. Who has a securities market that's big enough, liquid enough? I mean, you need all maturities of securities from four weeks to 30 years, you know, 10 year notes, five year notes, two year notes. You need primary dealers. You need an underwriting group, which is what the primary dealers are. They also make markets. You need settlement, clearance, distribution, custodians, you need hedging devices, when issue trading, repos, futures, options, you know, et cetera. You need that whole network. We've been building it for 230 years since Alexander Hamilton. Uh, no one else has it or anything really close to it. You know, maybe the Germans and the Italians, but they're not really big enough. And, and above all, you need the rule of law. I mean, nobody trusts the Chinese. Nobody trusts the Russians with their money. So, and they don't even have large sovereign bond markets anyway. So the dollar kind of wins the reserve currency, meaning really securities, crown because by default, there's nothing else that can compete with it. And there won't be soon. I mean, the things I described take 10 or 20 years to build. And again, the rule of law is probably the most important one.